Association of Cable Access producers, we're honored and privileged to have the uh, speaker tonight, Stephen Eric Broner, PhD, scholar extraordinaire, if you don't mind me saying so, Stephen. He's written a number of books on a great number of subjects. He was going to talk to us on the subject of Tucson, what happened and the right-wing media's influence and perhaps bringing those kind of things about. And he may mention that and so forth, but he's also written a number of books on the Middle East. He's traveled a great deal in the Middle East, and in view of the happenings in Tunisia and um, Egypt and the implications of that, he's very likely to stream off into some consideration of that, and then he'll be able to take questions and that sort of thing at the end. But I just wanted to, uh, those of you on the screen, uh, please do tune in, and uh, also we'll be putting this up on YouTube for tomorrow. And so without further ado, uh, my honor to welcome uh, to, the pro to, the, uh, to the meeting here, Stephen Eric Broner, uh, uh, true scholar. And Stephen, welcome and thank you very much for taking time out on this wintry day to talk to us. I'll tell you why I originally wanted to uh, come and talk to you, and it was actually not exactly about Tucson, but rather about something some of you may have heard about. And that is the attack of Gwen Beck on Francis Fox Piven. He's been sort of her, uh, she's been sort of his, uh, uh, I guess, whipping girl, if you want to put it that way, for a while now. Francis Fox Piven was the former president of the American Sociological Association, former vice president of the American Political Science Association, the author of two books that everyone read in the 60s, and that's Regulating the Poor and Poor People's Movement. She wrote those with her late husband, uh, Richard Clower. And uh, Frances is now 78. She's one of my dearest friends. And basically what's occurred is a situation in which uh, Francis has been put at the center of a huge conspiracy to destroy America. In other words, the argument is, and this is what uh, basically occurred, in, the, in 1966, Francis wrote an article uh, and actually was a major activist in attempts to get poor, uh, poor people, unemployed people, to exercise their rights to welfare benefits. Um, this was seen by many as seeking to overload the welfare, welfare roads, uh, welfare roles, create uh, the foundations for a guaranteed um, <coughs> minimum income, not a bad idea, by the way, and so transform America into a um, socialist, communist, anarchist system, you can choose whatever you want. Now, the thing gets weirder in the following way that Frank Piven, who is totally outside the, uh, the uh, mainstream of the Democratic Party, is seen as being the fundamental influence on um, President Obama and his attempt through especially health uh, healthcare reform to transform America into a socialist, communist, anarchist state, whatever, even though, of course, the socialist, communist, anarchist state, or whatever, was precisely what elected him. But we'll leave that aside. Mm. Given that all of you here are involved in um, media and democratic media, uh, I know Harold Chan has been committed to this all his life, and I'm sure you have as well, yeah, it seems to me this is a matter of some import because Glenn Beck, as you know, has said publicly, well, if you run into a communist and a communist believer, you may have to shoot him. Uh, you know about the kind of cl cultural climate that's been uh, generated by right-wing media, which verges on hate speech, if it doesn't turn into it, and which created uh, a climate, I think, in which these two sun shootings could take place. Now, in academia, the way things are usually analyzed is, is there, a, and certainly in the public as well, is there a direct connection between hate speech and this uh, deranged fellow who pulled the, uh, pulled the trigger and uh, shot uh, uh, Representative Gabby Giffords and killed um, uh, 
Judge, uh, Judge Jean Roll, as well as wounded and killed any number of other people. Can you make a direct connection? No. I don't think you can. But I don't think you have to. And it seems to me one of the things you have to talk about is creating indirect connect, uh, conditions for action. That's it's legitimate to talk about that as well. And it's legitimate to talk about creating a climate of opinion and a climate of political opinion whereby uh, this kind of um, these kind of actions can be generated. Media is a powerful thing, as, uh, as you know. This, uh, I don't think anyone here has quite the audience of Glenn Beck, uh, whose audience is shrinking, by the way. From the uh, height of 3 million, it's down to now about 1.8. Uh, this is over the last year. Maybe people are getting sick of this kind of conspiratorial paranoid vision. But the thing I would like you to think about is this. I don't think there are many people in this room who want to constrict free speech and uh, the civil liberties that define the best of our tradition. But I think it's time to begin talking more seriously about media responsibility. We're in a situation in which uh, an, a philosopher was very very popular in the 1960s, he had a big influence on me. Herbert Marcuse talked about repressive tolerance. And what he suggested was that tolerance used to be, uh, and, and the right to free speech and the like, used to be a way for the disempowered and the disenfranchised to make their voices felt. The question is, is this becoming a kind of uh, justification to inhibit free speech, to act, uh, or to inhibit uh, the disenfranchised and the exploited. Is it becoming, almost turning into a kind of part of a repressive apparatus? And I don't fully agree with everything that Marcuse said about this, but there clearly is a situation in which the idea that freedom of speech is linked to uh, a liberating and emancipatory project, that idea has started to become shaky. Now the question is, what do you do about it? And the, what you do about it, I think, is not to inhibit the internet or free speech. What you do about it, I think, is begin to think about how you highlight and emphasize the need for media responsibility. No one can do that better than you people. Uh, this is not as much an issue in, uh, in academia as it is outside. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the reasons I think um, Glenn Beck has attacked, and others, by the way, not just Glenn Beck, has attacked Francis Fox Piven, uh, along with uh, these other right-wing media pundits, is, I think, for three reasons. One is to deflect attention from real issues and the value of, by setting up this kind of stupid conspiracy, setting, uh, refusing to debate the merits of various proposals. Secondly, I think it's a um, way to denigrate a, what is perhaps best in the spirit of the 60s. We usually think of the 60s simply in terms of the counterculture, and we forget the political, uh, the political movements, the movements, so not just the civil rights movement, but the poor people's movement, the women's movement, those things which tr began to create almost a kind of social democratic consensus uh, among progressive people. It's a way to, de uh, to devalue that. And the third thing, and the most interesting thing is, I think, that Frances Fox Piven, precisely because of her academic as well as activist uh, celebrity, and she is a celebrity, yeah. her books have so, uh, sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Uh, it's a way to attack the only institution, uh, or one of the very few institutions, uh, careful, 
that the far right has not been able to touch, and that's the academy. And for all the jokes we make about the university and the academy, the truth of the matter is that the majority of places, especially public uh, institutions, institutions like uh, the City University of New York, where Francis teaches, uh, institutions like Rutgers University, where I teach, University of Wisconsin, um, where another target of, of Glenn Beck and David Horowitz uh, and other me media critics, namely Joel Rogers, teaches. These public institutions are part of the progressive inheritance of this country. And I'm convinced that by fastening on people like Piven, like Rogers, and others, especially in these kinds of universities, uh, one is attacking the only place where uh, a progressive discourse is actually taking place, and institutions which actually work to educate poor and working class people. Uh, can, they, can these institutions do it better? Yes, they can, uh, especially if they got a little more cash. Uh, but is there any, any other institution in the country that's doing as good a job? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. And uh, to this extent, I think that this issue of media responsibility for you people really comes down to three things. We've got to start talking less about personalities and more about, uh, and more about actual issues. I think it's very important for media people such as yourselves to link up with actual movements. I know it's a concern that, uh, that Harold has had as well. And the third thing is, and I know you're trying to do this as well as you can, uh, <coughs> try and link up with, <coughs> if you like, people of some kind of, uh, shall we say, intellectual quality and, po and political conviction, and start to attack those who are on the other side. Because the emphasis on the media on consensus by progressives is, I think, a disaster of the first order. Uh, it's time to start talking less about consensus and to treat people on the far right, uh, shall we say, uh, with this, uh, with the kind of sharp critique that can make them squirm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and the last thing is, I think we do have to think, start thinking about uh, things like boycotting uh, various uh, uh, corporations that control these media. It's possible. It's not impossible. These things can be done. We think back on uh, Cesar Ch uh, uh, people like Cesar Chavez. Uh, we think back on the divestment movements. Yeah, I mean, we're willing to talk about divestment in, um, in Israel we should be able to talk about divestment in these kind of corporations here at home. I don't see why not. It's time to take it back home. Is it a sure thing? No. Is it one part, is it something to think about and at least throw on the table? Perhaps. Perhaps. Shows have gone off the air when viewers have turned off. Yeah. Well, why is it only progressive shows that are the problem? You know, it's time to, I think, move it in a more political direction. And I guess what I'm asking for is a more heightened and a more disciplined and a more responsible yet civil sense of what um, political media means. And I think you, you people are certainly in the position to do it. Uh, it seems to me also, uh, now maybe I can make the segue into um, into the Middle East. Um, Before you go there, yes. may we make some comments? Or do you Try to course. speak up, please. Uh, uh, may we course. make some comments, or would you prefer that we wait till the end no, of your discourse? No, feel free. We, uh, uh, as you know, in the media, this what you present is quite difficult, especially in the American society, which in large is more concerned with celebrity <coughs> than with the concept of principles and um, 
concepts which are not visually tangible with whom they, the American uh, person can identify, a celebrity, a face, uh, an attitude, they can identify with that, and it's immediately um, recognizable. An issue, a concept, an abstract philosophy is difficult for them to, to grasp. We were speaking a moment ago about the Israeli situation. They, and large, are more intellectual. And you, we know that uh, the average uh, Israeli reads and has written more per capita than any other civilization. But if I can just cut you off uh, uh, with that. I mean, your point, is, your point, of course, is very well taken. And this is a very, very difficult project, and I'm not here uh, to tell you how to do it, you know, you must do it, and so on. All I'm here to do is sort of put some stuff on the table. You are the people who are engaged in the practice, and you have to figure out your own ways of doing it. Is it difficult? Yeah, it's going to be difficult. You're right. But when I was talking about dis divestment, I was talking about Americans concerned with divesting in Israel. The United States, young people in schools with, uh, with media assistance, uh, gained enormous help in uh, divesting in um, South Africa. Uh, that was, why, that was so. Me, why are you focused on Israel as, as divestment when the, when the real problem has to do with what's happening with, uh, with genocide going on in Darfur? Let me, uh, I'll talk to, I was just about to say, Save Darfur is an example. Uh, Save Darfur has been remarkably successful, not simply by using celebrities. I'm a critic of Save Darfur. I've been to Darfur three times. Right. Talk, uh, yeah. talk about what's going and on in the Congo and why, we're, why, why there's genocide going on there. None of that stuff is happening in Israel. That's a lot of... No, no, but I'm, I didn't mention genocide. All I, all I said was that there is an international movement. And, and, uh, 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 well, excuse me, but I don't understand why we as journalists can't be objective in that you, you're telling us to get political. Because, I, because in, my, in my view, the uh, objectivity si uh, situation, I think it's very hard to be objective anyway. I, don't, I can't think of anyone who is objective. One example of trying to be objective simply is stick to the facts is you wind up usually being stuck with uh, what occurred rather than what can occur. If we think of the uh, Middle East now, our objectives, uh, um, and I I in fact, even if we think of the, uh, the economic crisis, we think of our objective journalists out there, the people we look to, there was no one, no one who, uh, who anticipated what was happening. In political science, there was um, a teacher of mine at Berkeley, or a teacher who was at Berkeley while I was there, uh, who said he was president of the American Political Science Association. There are those of us who study power and those of us who criticize power, and we are the former. Well, if you want to do it that way, then the, the possibility of engaged scholarship simply vanishes, and the best people uh, come to be forgotten. You think of people like Edward R. Murrow. He was criticized for that. Martin Luther King was told, why, uh, was told to wait. Why can't we wait? Uh, and his major thing is called, why we can't wait. We have, to, uh, we have to get support from the outside. No, no, I think too much, uh, too often, objective scholarship, I don't even, and I, as I say, I don't, I'm not sure I know what that is, uh, tend the, the, uh, tends to be a veil for slipping in opinions and for narrowing the, uh, the parameters and the range of debate. Uh, if we think of the Middle East now, right now, what's going on in Tunisia and in Egypt and Jordan, we see a situation that, by the way, is I think not that different from 1989, which, by the way, wasn't anticipated either. Right. Sorry, yeah. you said we should divest. I, I think actually this gentleman came first. No, I didn't say you should divest. I'm saying that divestment was a was a strategy okay. that the no, people no, who supported. Uh, my question is, the corporations that you want, uh, us to, want to feel that we should use as a strategy to divest from, they are a monolith of, of, of unbelievable power. Look at the Citizens United case of a year ago. 
they're controlling everything that goes on in our lives. They're, they're controlling it, even the, the media market, the advertising market, in such a foul way. I've always felt that, um, that when we talk about control, yeah, I mean, they, they, there is an incredible imbalance of power. Like I said, there's nobody here with an audience like Glenn Beck's. But I don't think we should wind up in a situation where we feel ourselves, or we should take that to say there's an imbalance of power, even if it's enormous, and then say, well, we can't do anything at all. Yeah, could I suggest, uh, uh, Stephen, why don't you lay out your theme and your, your view, your overview of the Middle East thing that's coming now, and then let's hold back the questions in order to bring them up. Why don't you lay out your theme, thank you, thank thank you. Thank you. Well, please, yeah. because thank you. you're going to get interrupted with sidebar stuff. Okay. Well, as soon as you say anything against Israel, Barbara's going to interrupt. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's, <laughs> no, the, uh, the, uh, and that's totally legitimate to, to sure. raise the issue. I don't think there's genocide either. Uh, but I didn't raise the term genocide. No, I, I, I was yeah. using the example of the injustices that are going on all over the yes, world. Yes, I agree. And you took it on with it. Yeah, let him get on with it. Lay your thesis out. Your thesis correct. I, 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 uh, and you're telling us journalists that we have to get biased. No, I'm saying I'm saying you have to be. No, I'm not saying you. Ha no, that's not what I'm saying. You're putting words in my yeah, mouth twice now. Well, that's now wait, interpreted. no wait, no, that's not what I said. It's not. What I said was you have to be engaged. To be engaged means you can admit up front what perspective you're coming from. When you look at facts, they're open to interpretation in different ways. The issue for you as journalists is to make sure that your assumptions are on the table. Not that you should have no assumptions. You mean like Keith Olbermann should have uh, come forward and say that he, he donated money to these uh, if you like. candidates? If you like. That. That's a, although that's not an assumption. That's, an, uh, that, that's simply that's an action. His contract. But well, why don't we let him set out his thesis? But an assumption me. means what particular value are you starting with and where do you want to, and uh, how does this influence your particular view of events? To be reflective about that is not to engage in, in bias, it's not to engage in false scholarship, it's not to do anything like that. The best scholars are up front. If I speak about the existence of a paranoid streak in American politics, you know, mm -hmm. I look back and I look at the know-nothings of the 1830s, no, I no, look no. at the, uh, at the uh, Ku Klux Klan, I think of the America Firsters, I think of McCarthy, I think of the silent majority, the moral majority. There's a tradition coming, uh, coming through. The person who came up with the idea of a paranoid style was one of the great scholars of American history. That was Robert Hofstad, uh, uh, Richard Hofstadter. Yeah. yeah? Uh, you're looking at facts in a particular way. You're admitting and you're trying to be clear about what imputation you're, pl you're placing on those facts. That's legit. No, no scholar in any university would have problems with that. You know? Now, somebody could say, well, I think these movements were completely sane. It's also a, a, a position that goes on the table. That's how you build debate. When we look at what's remarkable about the media is that the attempt to, to simply base itself on isolated, narrow fact has created a narrowness of vision. And no place is this more apparent than in what's happened now in the Middle East, in my view. Because if you want to think about it, what we've had in uh, Tunisia, under the most repressive possible circumstances, we've had an, um, an uprising, a revolution, if you want to think about that, that is spread now to Jordan, it's spread to Egypt, of course, it spread to Albania, it spread to the Sudan mm -hmm. in, the, um, uh, in the north, yeah. and it spread to Yemen. How do we explain the, fa the phenomena that this, type of, uh, that this type of chain reaction has occurred? I have no theory, there has been no theory put on the table, especially by the objective media, but also not by uh, the objective or the uh, positivists uh, in academia either. Interestingly enough, it was exactly the same thing in um, 1989 mm -hmm. in, e in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. There's to this day no general theory that, that talks about how the masses were put into motion in Eastern Europe. 
That's true. You check it out and see what there is. But, but, but there is one. There is one. There's one person, ironically, uh, the person who I started my career being interested in. And uh, my views have changed and so on, but I started out uh, translating the letters of the great libertarian socialist Rosa Luxemburg. And Rosa Luxemburg in uh, 1905, which by the way followed exactly the same pattern, this chain reaction of events in Eastern Europe, which led to the 1905 revolution. It's called the dress rehearsal in 1917. <laughs> uh, same thing occurred. Rosa Luxemburg started with an international outlook, a larger, a larger picture. She saw the uh, success or failure of these kind of revolutions from below as depending not simply on the economics, which is the usual route, because all of these nations were incredibly poor, incredibly poor. It's a little worse, a little better for the, for the masses of the, uh, and for the wretched of the earth in those, in those countries, that little bit of difference is not gonna make, it doesn't make the difference. Indeed, we have these stale, old-fashioned views which masquerade themselves as objective. The, rise, uh, the theory of rising expectation. Things are getting better, and then um, only when things get better, kaboom, people's hopes are erased. But that's not true. That's not what happened in Tunisia. It certainly isn't what happened in, uh, in Yemen. Quite the opposite. The other argument, oh, we go for a fact, yet another fact. Let's bring in the internet. Except the internet had nothing to do with 1989. You had the same kind of, uh, of chain reaction. No. We also look at the corruption of the governments. Well, OK, so governments are corrupt. You know? All of the supposed objective views start with the view of the government. That's the interesting thing. They start with the governments. They don't start with the power or the empowerment of the masses themselves. It's interesting that all of these things sort of begin in cities. It's interesting that working people take the, primary, uh, take the lead and then the other groups cluster around them. It's interesting that these movements learn from one another exactly the kind of pedagogy that the mass media want to facilitate, which I, in my view should be facilitating, consciousness. Consciousness of grievances, consciousness of, we, of um, governmental weakness, governmental impropriety, and new outlooks democratic outlooks. That's something that was facilitated not simply by the, by the internet, although the internet played a role, and its suppression in Egypt made people even angrier, but by the fact that these groups learned that in these particular nations, the oppressed and the exploited learned from other nations. The, uh, the best example I can give you, it used to be argued, uh, the line was, the slogan was, Islam is the solution. Today, the slogan on the street is, Tunisia is the solution. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. What is it that we, that we don't know? It's not about some conspiracy. It's not about uh, uh, that kind of thing. Here's what we don't know. We yes. don't know the degree of political education that took pla place in almost clandestine form under these dictators. We don't know the values that have been put forward. We don't know the institutional structures that are, demand, that are being demanded and that are being put on the table. Well, yeah. so, you get, so you wind up and you look at CBS and you get your objective analysis and the most important factor in the entire set of events breaks down. One, the international character of these events. How was it generated? Two, what do these movements from below, what do they want? Democracy. Well, what kind? That's when it stops. That's when your work might begin as political journalists. Thirdly, 
notice that these, um, uh, these movements were not begun by dominant personalities and celebrities. Yeah? Notice also that these movements were, not, were done by the least, I mean by people whose educational level compared to that of the West, by all indicators, is much lower. What's going on here? And how are we looking at these people? That's something where you can intervene in the debate, and that's what I think is the purpose of a critical or uh, outside media, to foster the debate and expand it. May I join you here? You can join me anytime. I think there's one Wait. thing that, uh, in many oh, I'm sorry, maybe we should, maybe no, no, should. No, no, I don't want to, I, I just don't want you to be interrupted, but anyway. Oh, that's uh, that's nice. Well, let's uh, let's see what the, the you gentleman. Know, good, you know, you oh, thank you. But I, I concur with many of your uh, uh, presentations. Uh, however, in France and Paris, it's usually the students, not the working man. And two. Careful, careful. <laughs> careful, careful. I mean, it's it certainly was true in the sixties <coughs> that the students acted as catalysts. You're quite right. That was also true in Italy. Yes. It's also true that there were, uh, shall we say, working class organizations in place to be sparked. There were traditions working, see this is the thing, your point's well this taken. some currents, yes. Yes. And they joined. And what I would <coughs> think uh, in terms of a political media, what it's essential to emphasize, and many of you do, Harold does this, and others do too, is to sort of begin to highlight these subcurrents. And I think Show us what's not being shown outside. I think there's, yeah. a, there's a change today that has not been apparent throughout our history, and a very important one that has not ever been considered, and that is democratic communication. The Indeed. Internet, the internet, uh, Facebook, and these kinds of uh, social uh, intercourses, which are not regulated, they're quite open, and they're yeah. very democratic. You're quite right. They and don't have to be funneled through a media, through an interpreter, or any kind of method. It's free, completely Yes, free. and I, I think you're, you're, you're completely right. The, uh, the potential that the, that the internet offers is enormous. But here's the thing. It's a potential, and it depends upon people of political clarity and discipline. To use it in uh, to use it properly, because all of you know that these new media can also be used for the most stupid, vile, and disgusting purposes. So that's where the, the that's where the engagement comes in. Which way do you want to help channel it? You know. Well, that's and, also and the, the dilemma because it's not regulated, it's not supervised, yeah. and in some cases, it's utilized by ignorant or uneducated individuals. Exactly. But it is purely democratic. And to the extent to which we want to regulate it, you wind up hurting, uh, uh, if you want to put it, the cause, yeah. yeah. And you're hurting good people like yourself. Right. So in, in, in my view, that's why I don't think one can approach these questions, whether it's Glenn Beck or, um, uh, or anything else, I don't think we can approach this like uh, through, through legislation. I think this is where the, the ethical emphasis on responsibility is really important. And you know, for all our cynicism and uh, you know, our, uh, our skepticism of government, political organizations, uh, for all our vaunting of individualism, I think in, so, in, some, basic, in some basic way, we have to begin to think about a new, f about the importance of, of solidarity, the importance of, of expanding democratic empowerment, and that calls for a, 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 a genuine engagement, and that's exactly what we see in these, in these remarkable movements that we're faced with right now. Yes. I'm surprised yeah. that you've managed to talk about the uh, revolution in the Middle East as much as you can without mentioning WikiLeaks. Which you know, I was just thinking of. You know, it's very interesting. The uh, the WikiLeaks, I think, was very important. I agree with you, and uh, I was actually it was in the back of my mind. I'm so I'm totally with you. But 
I want to be clear, that alone isn't enough. There have to be organizations, subcurrents, as this gentleman, one of these gentlemen said, that are willing to take this up and make it more than just a scandal. You know? To be willing to look through this stuff and find out what's salient. And you're right, in Tunisia this played a tremendous role. And in Egypt as well. And they gave dozens of cables showing that the United States and Israel were uh, running mm -hmm. these dictatorships and then uh, within two weeks the dictatorships start falling. Here, here, a, here, a, uh, no, there's some, there's some, but let's be clear. This is a spark, but there's got to be the wood out there that allows it to catch fire. And that comes from these currents. That, that comes from uh, where the money is coming from. You I, do, I totally don't agree. No. I totally don't agree. There's you no look in, me, in Tunisia, there's no money. In Sudan, there's no money. Not, co not and, coming from the, the below. Tunisian government. No, no from, from these movements below. No, where, the, where the propaganda is coming from. And I want to tell you, back in 2008... Wait, wait, wait. Excuse me. You have these movements. I've seen these movements. These movements are not manipulated from the outside. I've seen these, yes I am. I've seen these, I've seen villages. I've seen, um, um, or I've heard the expressions of discontent. I've also seen movements which most people believe, since you mentioned Darfur, which are indeed coming, uh, 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 gaining money. Gr uh, groups like Jen. Groups like the uh, SPLMA, uh, the opponents of, um, of the regime in Khartoum, those are the ones who are getting the money. Do you know, do you know that back in 2008 that Ahmadinejad offered a million dollars to have uh, Mubarak oh, come assassinated? Oh, come on. This, 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 this million is, dollars, this nickel no, to have Aside from assassinated. this, aside, some, uh, aside from this, it doesn't the speak CIA to what we're that. talking about. It doesn't speak to what we're talking no, about. That's, uh, you that's can not put not out a million dollars. Anybody can put out a million dollars. That's fine. That's but not that's how that's movements begin. Well, it takes one it's step. No, it's not even a step. This hasn't. This is what they. That, I, that they had nothing to do with it. I'm saying that exactly that. I'm saying that the uh, that the Iranian, uh, if Iran had an impact upon this, it was these kids in the street who started the Green Revolution from which the Tunisians so you learned. Think, you think this came from a vacuum? You think it, no, it, that's ex you're gonna, I'm, I'm sorry, but if you're, gonna, if you're gonna interrupt me and ask, no, tell me, excuse tell, me. Tell me, is, ex isn't, isn't El Barra part, the head ex ex of this movement? No. No. He came in after the movement oh, began. Oh, after the movement. Oh, yes. So how did he get involved? He became famous as uh, he, he was the symbol of democratic opposition from abroad where he, where he lived. Can I have a say in this also? This but this is not, not but, but none of this is relevant. That's the important thing. The, 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 these movements as they begin, they begin from below. They begin through, uh, through people in opposition, through people who've been in jail through people who have, uh, who have really tested the limits. You, you're See, saying the citizenry are looting the museums? No, they're not. They're not doing that. I'm not well, saying that. What is it? Somebody is doing that. They're not monopolizing the conversation. Yeah. 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 Well, when I smell bullshit, I talk about it. Uh, premise, uh, one of your premises yeah. that you mentioned I think, we will get, I think we will get to it and at the end. So I have something very strong to say about this Arab Israeli problem, but I am not know. going to interrupt the speaker. Yeah, yeah I, I want to let the speaker finish. Yeah, let's let the speaker finish. Let's let the speaker finish. Let the speaker finish. And then we will get to the issues. Yeah, try to sum it up in 10 minutes or so, Eric. Don't interrupt. Um, I well, let me take this gentleman's question. Yeah, I mean, I'll take your the question. Thing I mentioned earlier was the fact that you, that, um, that journalists should, should be unobjective, or at least they cannot be objective to some degree. However, in the WikiLeaks situation, you have a, a quote unquote journalist who, who has did exactly what you had done, or what you had suggested should be done. And look at the results. Now, what, what do you think of that? Do you think that that was justified in what, what he did? I
personally think the uh, the um, the WikiLeaks situation. I was very shaky about it when it first happened, to be perfectly honest. But here's what I see. I see at the end of the day the arguments that were raised about American agents being uh, killed because of this abroad. It didn't turn out to be the case. What did turn out to be the case was, as this, uh, as this lady suggested, uh, WikiLeaks opened up to people who had no other means of communication various activities of their own government. They ha it helped transparency. Yeah. To that extent, it was democratic. Uh, I don't know the man who did it. I don't know Mr. Assange. I don't make any claims about it. I don't know if he's a nice person. I don't know if he's corrupt or he's not corrupt. I don't know if that, but in a way that doesn't matter. It's centering on the wrong thing. What is clear is that these WikiLeaks uh, helped generate this democratic revival in the Middle East. I mean, that to me is clear. And to that extent, I stand with it. But there yeah. was very few The real things dilemma. Finish. The things that were cable were all left. apparent. Everybody knew that. I mean, people there are, intellect there knew are, that. No, they didn't. There are I a million, there are, there are a you million no pages. Proof. No, I have no proof. That's correct. Excuse me. And there are a million he pages. He provided proof. He just provided the case. There are, there are a million pages, wow. which we haven't even read yet. So to say we know what's in it is, one thing's clear to the people who were the political actors, they didn't know. This helped spark, and, and that's, that's what's important. We're not yeah. sure whether that, is, that precipitated the spark, and I, that we don't know I, if the results are going to be the same, because who knows, there could be, they could be they could innate precipitation. I'll, I'll right. give you uh, so what I see. Precipitate a, a situation where you get a autocratic uh, government as well. The, well, you already have an autocratic government. Well, well, it's See, this is not a situation where you say, in my view anyway, this is not a situation where you say, well, you may get an autocratic government, therefore what? If we do nothing. The fact is they have an autocratic government. You want to roll the dice or don't you want to roll the dice? That's the question. And these governments are seriously autocratic. So I, I think I would look at it that way. Now, with, I wasn't going to talk actually about Israel at all. But if you want the contradiction, the, re, the serious contradiction is this. For better or worse, for right or wrong, the situation's been generated over the last few years, uh, over the last, let's say, 15 years particularly, in which the, uh, the street has been inflamed. You get a democratic, democratic government, or you get democratic movements, the or, some of these organizations are gonna be groups like the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm. That's right. Now, excuse me. Yes. I'm agreeing with you. Now, but you didn't let me finish. Huh? Yeah, let him make this point. Because the Muslim Brotherhood also has progressive factions. That we don't, that we don't get much, uh, uh, we don't learn much about. People like Tariq Ramadan, is one example, but you can find others. Now, how? Now, to me, the, the question for those of you who are, I'm Jewish myself, for those of you who are interested in Israel and concerned with Israel, the practical reality is this. It's the toughest political test that's out there. Where do you, how do you identify the, the moderate, open-minded, liberal factions within these kind of movements. You can rant back and forth, you don't like this, you don't like that. The, at the end of the day, <coughs> that's the only hope, in my view. And it's something which, again, is not emphasized enough in the media. You all know about the Islamophobia, so we go back and forth, or oh, they're, good, they're, they're good Muslims, they're bad Muslims, this, that. No, that's not the, the issue. The, the political issue is how do we begin to specify who we can talk to and who we can't. And I want to hear out of, out of these multi-billions of people, there's no one you can talk to. It's not true. I've even, I, I even heard in, in Sudan political people talking about 
they've had enough of the, uh, they've had enough of the Palestinians, and uh, they were talking about about Israel. That's purely in, in terms of personal conversation. It wasn't on the on the table or anything like that. How do you begin to find the people you can talk to within these movements like the Muslim Brotherhood? You know, that's the great task. And in order to do that, you first have to create a climate where groups like these aren't simply stigmatized stereotypes and the like. Otherwise, you get nowhere. You, know, you sometimes have to, have to talk to people you may not like, you may not agree with, who represent stuff which is totally opposed to what you think in order to make that much of a step forward. That's just the way it is. But you got to know who. And to break the stereotypes, that's the other media can help. And you, uh, sir, have been very patient. You said you wanted to ask me something. Yeah, Joseph. Yeah, Steve. Joseph. So you are a political scientist. I'm a humanist activist. You're better off. I like to think of myself as an well, activist. Well, it's a sort of conglomeration of philosophy psychology, theology, and maybe even biology. All right. Uh, what human beings really represent is their knowledge, their feelings, their entrapments, and their ambitions. I mean, this is an oversimplification. But that applies to any kind of a situation where we are considering the resolution of uh, vital and dangerous explosive situations. Now, um, how should I say? The, uh, the central issue that I can see is a kind of a uh, fusion of uh, what touches the gut of people. If we want to do anything, if he don't cut, touch the gut of the people, and some of those, you know, they have mentioned, those individuals who precipitated social movements and uh, political uh, upheavals, were touching the gut of the people and were touching on something very concrete and vital. And I think that there is a uh, problem in fusing economics and deep psychology. Uh, in my opinion, what moves people is the basic dangers, hunger, oppression, and so on, but also what they believe as their highest, so to say, um, factors that affect well, life. And that is, in my opinion, personal religion. Not the religions of the, you know, Judaism, Christianity, but what people believe in their gut, what is the most important and what has to be done, and so on. And if we can relate to that, then those of us who work with the public have a chance. Maybe you may be right. I myself have worked with uh, Conscience International. I'm the chair of the executive of uh, U.S. Academics for Peace. What is that? We were uh, in, uh, we do civic diplomacy. We were in Iraq before the mm -hmm. war. Some of you may even have signed some of our petitions. There's this big petition that went around with uh, 50,000, 60,000 people. Went around the, the internet. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was in Iraq before the war. I've been to Iran, I've been to Syria, been to the West Bank, I've uh, been to, uh, to Darfur and, and, uh, and Sudan. And in a way, I think you're right. I think there is a core thing. But I'd like to translate it into a different word rather than simply personal religion mm -hmm. because some religions you don't get that kind of breakdown. How about justice or fairness? Some sense that, that you're aggrieved, even in the most simple terms. 
I think that's right. I think at the end of the day, uh, these people didn't simply go out because they were poor. Because they don't, they've always been poor. They <coughs> went out because if you like their commitment to justice and democracy and equal treatment were in some way, and for whatever set of reasons, sparked. And they realized they were capable of doing it. And that's very important, you know, to feel you're capable of actually taking, taking your destiny in your hands. Now, having said that, and I'm totally with you, I'm a humanist myself, uh, but having said that, what this gentleman said, your name is? Walter. Walter. What Walter said is right on some level. You have people in the street, you have si and it's simple people, mostly the uneducated, the wretched of the earth, if you want to put it that way. To translate that revolt into, into institutional democracy, tough. Can it be done? Yes. Am I sure it will be done? No. Because sometimes it's been done, and sometimes it hasn't been done. And here, one is stuck stuck at the level of a gamble. You know? But here, but at the same time, if we think of uh, the Middle East, as surely as if we think of the Soviet Union, uh, the old Soviet Union, there's a similar phenomenon, I think. They were ready to take the gamble. And uh, certainly on the table is, it, is the demand for a Republican form of government. Will the, is that the only demand on the table? No. Have, uh, are they, do they have the same kind of traditions that existed in the United States when the Republican form of government was brought, brought into existence? Probably not. But is there a chance for it? Yeah. And these people are willing to take, uh, to take the chance. And if we think of uh, uh, even of the United States with the democratic form of government, when do you think that America really became democratic? It was legitimate to talk about democracy in there as a real thing. It's probably 1964, the Voting Rights Act. Right? I mean, but people always said, it's democracy, and it was. They, say, they used to say in the South, it was if you were free white and 21. Yeah, <coughs> and you weren't. Did it go bad? And male. Well, no? I'm sorry? And, and male. And male, yes. <laughs> yeah. And property, you can even <laughs> say. Yeah, you're right. Uh, democracy is a process, and it was a process here. It's a process in Eastern Europe. I mean, let's face it, what's happening in the Soviet Union it does not exactly make the heartbeat of every good Democrat, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Right. Yeah? I mean, there's a process involved. Now, the question for in, in, uh, in the Middle East was, was there an attempt to begin the process? And that's a gamble, and that's the way it has to be. That's so the, the do, you way th do you think that the fact that there was a 30-year emergency rule in Egypt played a big part in this, and that people got tired of living under emergency rule? What yeah. I want to know is why, why in this country we're not, we no longer are talking about the Patriot Act, and why isn't there You're a absolutely right. to repeal the Patriot Act? It's the same thing as emergency rule, in Egypt, aren't we sick of this? You know, I, 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 in this, I, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. It's remarkable how, you know, for whatever criticisms we have of President Obama, right? And I'm sure all, a lot of you have criti legitimate criticisms from the left. I, you may want single-payer health insurance or uh, the public option. You may want more, you know, uh, greater job creation, so on. I'm totally with you. But here's the difference. Here, here I completely agree with you. I, didn't re I don't remember there were demonstrations in the street uh, at the time of the bank bailouts for job creation. 
I don't remember any big demonstrations on health care sweeping the country. You know? I mean, it, at some level, I think what this yeah. event in, in the Middle East teaches, I'm sorry. Fluoride in our toothpaste and in our water and iodized salt. Between the two, uh, it's some kind of uh, uh, rain depressant. Yeah, well, I, I don't know what to say about that, but but perhaps part of the perhaps part of the story is that there has been a narrow that is the narrowing of political debate and the narrowing of the imagination, particularly by progressive people. And no, if one wants something, side, we've the got. The other side isn't, isn't happy with it either. Yeah, but they're in the street. Yeah, right. You got to give them that. They you are gotta the give street. them that. They Bob, are. Bob, you gotta give them that. Oh. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> can you go back to the Middle East for a second? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't doubt that these are popular movements. Yeah. And I don't doubt that they depend on years and years of political education among the masses. You mentioned um, you know, you mentioned the Jamaat Muslimin in Egypt. Rashid Ganoushi in London, right. just referring to Tunisia, these are very important. But let me, let, you said that there's no theory to link these as... Oh, no, I... Sort of, let, me, let me just say, there, there's no ensemble that we can think about these, just as there's probably no ensemble that we can think about these things in 1989. But let, let me just, you know, and Marcuse was my professor, too, so... Ah. And he said, he said that, uh, what makes you think that paranoia is not the most rational thorn philosophy? <laughs> for the modern age. Okay, so let me just interject these, these few facts here. Um, I refer you to a recent report by the Brookings Institution that said, who's afraid of the Muslim Brotherhood? They are have been our guys since at least 2001. Okay, they are the moderate Islamist opposition. Um, there was well, parts a report, of it. There was a report uh, this weekend in the London Telegraph. Uh, they obviously had been poring over WikiLeaks and found that uh, there were a number of U.S. supported activists in Egypt who had been trained sure. to do this stuff. Okay, uh, even beyond that, you can look at last week's Der Spiegel magazine, which had a cover story on Facebook and basically explained that Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are heavily infiltrated by the U.S. government by the U.S. intelligence services. Okay, Facebook, Twitter. YouTube, these are the strategic mechanisms that are being used for communication in these revolutions. It's not as free and open as you think. And if it's as free as an open, you don't know who is operating in these domains. Okay, I'll also refer you to um, going back about five or six years, Jean Daniel in the Nouvelle Observateur reported that the, 19, the revolutions in Eastern Europe and in Central Asia these color-coded revolutions were, were almost universally financed by Soros' OSI. They had the t-shirts, the colors, the next day they were out in the streets. So, you know, we do have... How'd they get them in the streets? What? How'd they get them in this the streets? This was all basically, you know, this was... No, no, no. How did they get the people in the streets? They... No, I'm not disputing the fact that these are popular uprisings, okay? But there are material considerations that are involved and necessary, and we cannot discount, we can't be naive about this. You know, to my mind, Hillary Clinton is walking in the footsteps of Che Guevara. They're getting out in front of this. They're, this is, this is okay. strategic, this is, this is strategic policy by yeah, the United States. These are, these are, these are, there are hidden signals being sent to the Saudis that they better pay up because we can, we can basically bring the street and get them out of power. These are strategic signals in Africa being sent to the Chinese, who are very ambitious in this domain. I mean, you know, Let we're using, this is, a, this is a country whose back is to the wall. They have no resources. They're out of money. So what is it? It's a Hail Mary. We do have, we do have yeah, I a democratic do. tradition to throw out there. And they will use it. They are as cynical the, as I am. Uh, really? <laughs> well, <laughs> they are as absolutely <laughs> cynical as I am. They will use anything they've got to let maintain me, their power. Let me right. put it to you this way. <laughs> uh, go 
going backwards, my teachers were all political realists. Political realists in the sense that they bracketed ideology and they looked at the interest. 